Well, hello, Introduction to Psychology. This is our third set of lectures, and in this set of lectures, we're talking about what do you do once you've designed an experiment, run an experiment, and collected the data? How do you make sense of the data? Um, we're going to address this issue in a math-free way. So if you're a math phobe, don't worry, this is going to be almost entirely conceptual. Um, how do we make sense of data? Well, the ways in which people interpret data um, have both a rigorous side, but also a devious side to them. So I would be remiss in not mentioning uh, the famous quote by Mark Twain, there are three kinds of lies, lies, damned lies, and statistics. And I think you'll see what he meant by that um, in a few slides. Descriptive statistics. How do you describe the data that you've collected? Um, there's a lot of different ways to do it. We're going to talk about the simplest ones. We'll talk about frequency distributions, which is just essentially um, counting the number of responses or events that have happened and displaying that in a way that's easy to understand. We're going to talk about measures of central tendency, which is very simple calculations to get a, just a rough sense of what sort of the average uh, response was. And we're going to talk about uh, variance, how much variability in the responses or the data that you collected is there. Okay, let's start with the frequency distribution because every student who's taken an exam uh, hopefully um, has seen a frequency distribution after that exam. Um, a frequency distribution is just a way of counting up the number of each type of response or measurement that you've made. So here is a frequency distribution, which is understood as a graph or a table, that describes simply how many people have a particular score. And this is a frequency distribution of heights. Um, it's in inches. And you can see that the average height is about 64 inches, and then uh, it drops off from there. So fewer people um, have heights at, that are a little below or a little above that. Uh, frequency information and percentages can be displayed in any number of ways. So you've just seen a frequency distribution. You could do it entirely with numbers and present something as a table. You could present something as a bar chart, which is essentially a kind of frequency distribution turned on its side. Um, pie charts are another way to do it. There's no right or wrong way. Um, it, but how you present the data has a big impact on the ways in which people interpret the data. To, I want to give you a, some frequency distribution data that um, will give you something to think about and chew on. So um, this is sort of a complicated graph, but let me take a step back and tell you what it is. Essentially, it's a measure of how much income a household in the US has had on average, each year from 1967 until 2015. And if you um, plot just the overall average of that data, you'll see that um, salaries in the US or incomes, household incomes in the US have either held steady or increased a little bit um, over those decades. But what this graph shows you is that if you pull the data apart a little bit, a very different story is told. So in this case, each of the five lines um, uh, doesn't show you all of the data. It shows you the data from 20% of American households. And that bottom line that's like a light green those are households with the lowest 20% of household incomes in the US. Um, there's a purple line in the middle that's sort of flat, and uh, that would be um, 
sort of the middle salaries in the US, and then there's a sort of a powder blue line at the top. Those are the incomes, household incomes of the top 20% of the wealthiest Americans in the US. Okay. So when, when you present the data overall, you say, yeah, Americans have had a modest salary increase over the, or a modest uh, income increase over the years um, when corrected for inflation. But if you are interested in social justice, then inequities are something you pay attention to. And there is a colossal inequity in these data given the way they're presented. Notice that for the bottom 60% of Americans, the household income is absolutely flat. Uh, and I gotta tell you, there's been some big changes since the 1960s. Remember back in the 1960s, a lot of households were single income households. Not all of them, but a lot of them. Now there's very few single um, uh, income households or relatively few, the percentage is less. And yet the household income, not individual income, the household income is flat. But look at the top 20% of the wealthiest Americans. What has their income done since the 1960s? Boom, increased quite a bit. Um, so this is just a, 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 to give you a sense that the way in which data are presented change, changes the way people perceive them. So you can do all the math and you might think that people will interpret it objectively, but you can take the same data set and display it in different ways to prompt people to draw very different kinds of conclusions. Uh, here's another frequency distribution. This is a frequency distribution related to global warming. Um, and you can see, so the individual points are um, temperature changes um, by year. Um, and what I want you to see is there's that red horizontal or diagonal line um, while there is temperature variation, there's an overall uptick in uh, temperature. Um, so this is evidence of global warming in a frequency distribution. Um, but I want to cycle back now and, and really focus in on the question of how you present data determines, in large part, how people interpret those data. So if we just focus on the graph on the left-hand side of the slide, um, what's presented there, font's a little small, but what the, is presented there is, a, is this is a um, hypothetical data from uh, four different companies that sell pickup trucks. In the US, people love to drive pickup trucks. And um, so these are four different brands of pickup trucks. And the data show the percentage of pickup trucks that are still on the road, still being used, still functioning after 10 years. And it looks like there's quite a bit of variation between the percentage of, uh, the percentage of pickup trucks that are still functioning 10 years later as a function of what brand we're talking about. So one brand seems to have a very low rate of the pickup truck holding on for 10 years and an, another brand seems to have a very big rate but if you, this is where um, people can get tricky. If you look at the vertical axis, the numbers go from 100% to 95%. That is a very small part of the distribution. The numbers in reality should vary from zero to 100%. It's possible that there'd be no cars left on the road. It's possible all the cars could be left on the road, that it's still functioning. So let's plot the same data from zero to 100%. That gives you the graph on the right. The graph on the right tells you there's really no difference between these four brands of pickup trucks. The graph on the left implies that there's a big difference between these pickup trucks. Same data, but how you present them changes the way people will interpret them. Here's another example. Um, 
These are data from the TV station CNN back in 2005, and they conducted a survey of uh, Democrats, Republicans, and independents, and what percentage of them agreed with a particular Supreme Court decision. And the data there are plotted in a way that make you think that there's a very big difference between the way Democrats and the way Republicans feel about a particular decision that was made about, by the Supreme Court. But again, look at the vertical axis. It only goes from the number 64 down to the number 50. If we, again, use the whole axis, if we go from 0 to 100% and plot the data again, you get the graph that's on the bottom with the purple bars. And you can see if you look at the data in that way, there's basically no meaningful difference between the way Democrats and Republicans and independentists, independents um, felt about a particular Supreme Court decision. So again, same data, the way they're described changes the way they're interpreted, the way that your results are interpreted. Uh, one last uh, example, this is from um, two newspaper companies in England. Uh, the graph on the right, I'm sorry, the graph on the top um, seems to imply that one newspaper has a great deal more sales than the other newspaper. But again, if you change the vertical axis, it looks like there's very little difference between the sales of these two newspapers. So these sort of examples <laughs> harken back to that uh, Mark Twain quote that we started out with. There's three kinds of lies, lies, damned lies, and statistics. Okay, that's it for this segment. We'll come back later and talk about measures of central tendency.